how many of you knew Florida before 1950? <laughs> Yay, there are some of us. Well, my parents, snowbirds from New Jersey, first came to Florida because my father's brother had moved to Clearwater Beach and lured us down in 1948 to check out Florida. It took us just a few months to pack up <laughs> and head south. And my family has been here ever since. My two brothers are still Floridians. One lives not far from here, the other lives in Orlando. I have a home over on New York Avenue, but I'm bi-coastal. My other coast is in California, where my other daughter was born, but she went to school here at Dunedin Day School when she was a little kid. I went to Dunedin Junior High School when there was Dunedin Junior High School, yeah. <laughs> and then to Clearwater High School when Clearwater had clear water. Mm. <laughs> I went to Florida, well, I went to St. Petersburg when it was junior college, now it's college. There were 300 students when I was there, now there's something like 60,000 students. And let's see, from there, Florida State University. I also spent a couple of years at the University of Florida, so I'm a Gator as well as a Seminole. <laughs> But it's Florida that really shaped my life as it has yours. You can't not be shaped by Florida if you come here, and especially if you live here for a while. What is it about Florida, anyway, that um, just wraps itself around your mind and becomes a part of you? But for me, it was the Gulf of Mexico that really started me on a lifetime love affair with the ocean. Well, actually, it was New Jersey where I got knocked <laughs> over by a wave when I was three. <laughs> but I was really ready to embrace the ocean when I was 12, and we actually made the move to Dunedin. But the first place was not over on New York Avenue. It was on Wilson Street, near where the citrus concentrate is located and my mom and dad started a little like so many people they started a little operation to have places where people could come and stay a little motel over on wilson street so i drive by there once in a while and oh has it changed <laughs> where did all those buildings come from anyway <laughs> and you can't go down to the to the water on wilson street anymore and there's one building, I think, that still remains from what was there when my parents had that place. But then we moved over to Wilkie Street and planted trees. My mom and dad were always planting trees, always. <laughs> one time I was the smallest member, most distant memories. It's always about planting trees, giving back. And the trees that my parents planted here in Dunedin are now kind of biggish. <laughs> they also helped plant the Dunedin, the Union Street Methodist Church. They were the founders of part of, the, of, of that group. And the trees that you see around there were largely planted when my mom and dad um, began working with the community to do that. But my father was, when, when we were in New Jersey and when we came here, always involved with, with city governance. And among other things, he served on the city commission here in Dunedin for many, many years. And if you look around and see the great old oak trees that many of us love about this city, you can thank my dad for their existence because he fought. <laughs> he lost some, but he won some really important victories in terms of keeping 
those grand old, old, old oak trees that are increasingly rare all over the country. Old trees give way to new plantings and, oh, you know, the ideal ide way of starting a new place was to clear a lot of whatever was there and plant little twigs, usually of something exotic. But for whatever reasons, my mom and dad sort of got the concept early on. They should plant trees and other things that are native to an area. So oak trees, the native pines, the holly trees that are native to Florida, the Palatka hollies, and, and so on down the line. But when you drive around the state, you see a lot of things that weren't here a thousand years ago, or a hundred years ago, or even 50 years ago, and have been imported from all over the world. Why? Because not only is Florida a wonderful habitat for humans, it is really friendly to vegetation that is imported from all over the planet. But be that as it may, there, there is a growing movement to try to restore some of that which is native Florida. And I love the native plant society that is here in this area that grows some of the native wildflowers and trees and shrubs and encourages people to plant those as a part of restoring Florida, the good part that was here before humans arrived. So today, I'm going to just take you on a little journey starting from where I started up in New Jersey and then sort of march through where I have finally wound up back home. Well, it all started in New Jersey. As a kid, I had complete freedom to go play in the woods, to spend all day out just fooling around on my own, often. I mean, a lot of the time, just on my own. Left back, I'm waiting for someone, someone to be my friend. My mother was known as the bird lady of the neighborhood. People would bring injured squirrels, birds, frogs, anything that needed help. My father was really so bright and so capable of fixing things. When I was a little kid, I tried to take things apart to see how they worked and it always reminded me to save all the pieces, don't lose any, and be sure you know how to put it back together again. We're losing a lot of the parts, the loss of the diversity of life on Earth, the bits and pieces that have just disappeared. We don't know how to put things back together again once they're gone. When I was 12, we picked up and moved to Florida. At first, I was not particularly charmed because I loved the other place so much. But the Gulf of Mexico was this great blue body of water that created almost this mythic place that lured my parents there. Some kids play in the streets. Some kids have a backyard. My backyard was wet. It was the Gulf of Mexico. It was glorious. So those birds that you saw were rescued by my younger brother. She, he saw some kids walking down what is now Patricia Avenue with a gunny sack filled with uh, five little featherless snowy egrets. They thought they needed rescuing. <laughs> But anyway, my brother rescued them from the boys, and my mom really taught them how to fish at the little lake that now is called Lake Earl over on New York Avenue. And wonder of wonders, they all matured to full adult size, and ultimately, they flew away. And they came back the next spring <laughs> with their buddies. And my mother used to go down to uh, Saunders fish house, and get the scraps, chop them up, feed them to not only the snowy egrets, but the American egrets and the great blue herons and all the creatures that came for a handout. Well, 
they ultimately did find better places to find their groceries, but it was a success story that I grew up with, that attitude of trying to heal nature, give back, and I think it's something that we all can do at this remarkable time in history when, as never before, we know what none of our predecessors could know. And I try to tell kids today, look up and see the stars. And so often you cannot. It's a miracle when the night sky is open like this. So if you haven't yet witnessed a sky like this, find a place where you can. Because what it does is sort of remind you that here we are, the little blue speck amid just this vast universe where we really huh, are alone in terms of a, a place that is alive. We are the blue planet, a planet with an ocean. There's a lot of water we now know in our solar system and out there in the universe beyond. But huh, where else is there an ocean filled with life? No other place as far as we can tell. And this image transformed a lot of things about the way we think about ourselves. It was taken by a, a young man, an astronaut, William Anders, who just was able to convince NASA that they should take a camera with a long lens on board. And they finally gave in and let him do it. And he took this picture. Earthrise. He took a lot of pictures, but this one really stuck in the minds and hearts of people in 1968 on Christmas Eve when he took this photograph. So now we have a different way of looking at ourselves and appreciating kind of who we are alone in the universe. Well, we can think about, oh, let's go to Mars and set up housekeeping there. And a lot of people were. Jeff Bezos wants to send 50,000 people to Mars. Uh, I say, let me have the list. <laughs> I would love to fulfill that wish, <laughs> for some. <laughs> but actually, it's the blue one that I like the most. Don't you? I mean, this is home. And we do have this wonderful feature, the ocean. The thing is, we still are exploring the ocean for the first time in most of the ocean. Uh, literally, the, the ocean has only been mapped with the same, well, less accuracy for the ocean than we have for the moon or Mars or Jupiter <laughs> or most of the land. Only about 10% has that kind of accuracy. We've done a pretty good job of mapping the Gulf of Mexico, but almost anywhere, everywhere else, it's, uh, it's mostly there to be done. Most people are not fully aware of why the ocean matters. Uh, the attitude that I grew up with as a kid, that the ocean is so big, so vast, so resilient that we can take anything out of it that we want to, put anything into it that we want to, no problems, the ocean will take care of whatever it is. We didn't know when I was a kid that most of the oxygen in the air we breathe is generated by little green guys out there in the ocean. We have respected trees and grass and flowers and all the things on the land because they capture carbon dioxide and generate oxygen but it just didn't occur to most people, and it still doesn't to many, that we should be thanking the ocean with every breath we take. And of course, with every drop of water we drink, because most of Earth's water is ocean. It goes up into the clouds, falls back, gives rain, or in some parts of the world, snow. Not here, but... <laughs> we didn't even appreciate how important plankton, those little green things in the ocean were, to making fish, to making the carbon cycle function. It, the little 
tiny microorganisms are munched on by little tiny animals. Little copepods, larval crabs, baby starfish, baby fish, baby almost everything. The, it's like a zoo when you look out at plankton in the ocean. But that's, that's lunch and dinner and breakfast for the fish in the sea, the little fish when they're tiny. And they, of course, are eaten by bigger fish and right up the food chain until you get to the big fish. It's fun to actually be out there as a witness in the, this food chain, this carbon cycle in the ocean. The, the real point is don't be a part of the food chain yourself while you're <laughs> watching it happen. But it is such a thrill to be out and see these giant creatures whose history goes back hundreds of millions of years and they're still with us. You know, as a kid I often thought how great it would be to see a dinosaur. Well, these preceded dinosaurs by at least 200 million years. Sharks, they're living fossils and they're still here with us. Variations on the theme of life in the sea. They're amazing creatures. <laughs> when I first started diving in the 1950s, I was told to watch out for the sharks. They're man-eaters out there. And then I came to understand that if they're man-eaters, I don't qualify, so I'm safe. <laughs> <laughs> but now we know sharks aren't really interested in humans. I mean, occasionally they munch on one of us. But consider how many sharks humans consume. You know, they should be afraid of us. Hundreds of millions of sharks are being killed, partly just for the joy of it. People have this idea, some do, that the only good shark is a dead shark. And there are a lot of dead sharks now, some for shark fin soup, a luxury taste that is resulting in the loss of many of the sharks that were abundant when I was a kid. But here's the thing, we have learned just in my lifetime the sharks aren't so bad after all. In fact, they're really good. We need the sharks in the sea. And I love the fact that kids are champions of sharks the way kids are champions of dinosaurs. You can't bring back the dinosaurs, but we can save what we have of the sharks. And around this country and around the world, there's a growing move to protect sharks the way we have come to protect whales. Why? Because we respect them for reasons other than being dead. <laughs> you can turn a dead whale into barrels of oil and pounds of meat, whatever you want to use a dead whale for. But a live whale, we don't know how to make them, we know how to kill them. Same is true with a shark. Same is true with a tuna fish. A lot of people still love to eat tuna fish, but if we keep taking them the way we've been taking them, there won't be tuna fish, just as we came perilously close to losing sharks. And how and, and to losing whales, but sharks, 90%, 90% of the sharks are gone. But when you look at the bluefin tuna and other tunas, they too are in serious trouble. They have followed this time of decline for great abundance, going back to when I was a kid to now great scarcity. So what can we do? We can learn the value of the living systems, the living creatures. It's fun to go out and catch fish, right? Only catching fish on a large scale. We're just so good at it now that we have taken the numbers from where they were to a perilously low level. Big trawlers, big fishing fleets that are literally strip mining the ocean of life that's there. Swordfish used to be big and common. Now they're much smaller and much rarer because we're so good at finding them and catching them. And yes, we eat some of them, but we used to do that with whales too. But now we see there's a value in whales, a value in sharks, a value in tuna, alive. Doesn't mean that we won't still eat tuna, but if we keep taking them at the level we are currently, we won't have a choice they'll be gone. Oh, listen to the whale. 
<laughs> if we could listen to them and say, you know, don't eat us. <laughs> Come play with us. Oh, but you know, we have eaten a lot of them and some nations still take whales for pounds of meat and barrels of oil, but fortunately we stopped killing them in the 1980s for the most part around the world. And so we don't have to see whales in a museum the way we see the bones of dinosaurs. We have live whales out there. We do in the Gulf of Mexico. Who knew until fairly recently that the populations, resident populations of sperm whales are out there in the Gulf of Mexico. Humpback whales and other species. No gray whales in the Atlantic Ocean anymore. There used to be but they're all gone long before <laughs> you arrived. It wasn't your fault, it wasn't my fault, but it was just the attitude that we can take from nature as much as we like with no consequences back to us. But the great thing about coming along early in the 21st century is knowing what we now know. First of all, why wildlife matters. Why, why taking care of the ocean, taking care of fresh water, taking care of the planet matters. Yes, we will consume ocean wildlife, but to recognize the cost, what it takes to make a fish like this little orange roughy. Any of you ever seen orange roughy on the menu in the grocery store, or whatever? I think I can still find it in markets for about $10 a pound. These creatures take about 30 years to mature. Little filet of orange roughy on your plate could be 100 years old. The oldest ones that have been measured looking at the bones in their ears that re register time the way rings on a tree do are more than 150 years old for little fish that we can consume in 20 minutes. And we have consumed so many of the creatures in the ocean. Again, if we could listen to them the way we've listened to whales <laughs> and get to know them the way we've gotten to know birds and whales and other creatures, to see that they have faces, they have personality. The biggest fish in the sea, a shark, the whale sharks, really abundant in the Gulf of Mexico. Who knew? I had a chance to go a hundred miles offshore from the southern coast of Louisiana and encountered a place, this place, where more than a hundred whale sharks were gathering to munch on the eggs of a little tuna, just there at the time that the little tuna spawned. It was amazing. As a kid growing up in Dunedin, I had no idea that the biggest fish in the sea was one of my neighbors, just right out there in the Gulf of Mexico. They're there. And yet, we land lovers <laughs> are oblivious to the incredible action that's going on right offshore, not that far offshore. Oh, getting to see the fish, getting to see their faces, <laughs> listening to them. You know, fish make sounds the way birds do, the way whales do, the way dolphins and seals, you know, grunts, grunt, croakers, croak. <laughs> I haven't heard the sounds that moray eels make, but I have heard groupers make this <clears throat> deep, low sound that you can feel as well as hear. They are amazing, and we are just beginning to look at them as something other than, hmm, let's see, fish sticks, uh, <laughs> fish fillet, catch of the day, or something of the sort. But the time has come when we can do that. I feel personally blessed, and so are you. You've come along when getting into the ocean, meeting fish, swimming in something other than lemon slices and butter, is possible. <laughs> My mom waited until she was 81 to put on a mask and go look at the ocean. She'd seen fish on a plate many times. Um, 
She had been to aquariums, of course, but being one-to-one, -one, free in the sea, face-to-face, -face, it's kind of a different experience. You just can't look at a fish stick the same way again. <laughs> at least I can't. <laughs> and to know that everyone has its own individual DNA. You know each of you has your own DNA, so does every fish. They're all different. They all may look alike superficially, but if fish swam into this room, they'd probably say, oh, people, they all look alike. <laughs> you know, two arms, two legs, you know, all that. Every starfish, however similar they might appear, if you really look at them, no two exactly alike. Or mantis shrimp, or shrimp in your shrimp cocktail, you know? That's one of the great miracles that I've discovered as a given the chance to go splash around in the ocean. And my first time was in the Gulf of Mexico. I was privileged to be able to use one of the first scuba tanks that came into the country back in 1953. And it was while I was taking a summer class at Florida State. And the professor was able to kind of snag two, uh, two scuba tanks and two of the first regulators with a big mouthpiece and double hose and so on. And we had two words of instruction, breathe naturally. <laughs> <laughs> and we all survived. <laughs> but I've been breathing naturally, jumping in ever since. And back in 1970, had a chance to be one of the individuals who could live underwater for a couple of weeks. The team of women among 50 men. They didn't like the idea of having men and women living together. I mean, you have astronauts up in the sky, but there were no ast women astronauts at that time. But I've done it 10 times now to go stay underwater day and night and get out into the ocean by swimming through a little hole in the floor of your underwater dwelling and get to get up close and personal with the fish, to get them, as, as know them as individuals. That was the hydrolab. Here's the Aquarius that is still down in the Florida Keys, where the mixed teams of men and women, and we do get along. We ride airplanes together, and we go to the grocery store together. You can, <laughs> can actually stay for a few days underwater together. It works out. And here's how you escape into the ocean using either just regular old scuba, you could use rebreathers, you can use fancy equipment like this that enable you to talk with people, the land, those land dwellers, the ones up on the surface, <laughs> communicate widely. But to go deep, breathing compressed air, or even exotic mis mixes of gases, only works to about 1,000 feet, only about 100 feet if you are using scuba. And guess what? That's just the skin of the ocean. That's that upper sunlit portion where you snorkel, where you go diving if you're, you're swimming or surfing. But the average depth of the ocean is two and a half miles. Light only penetrates to about a thousand feet where you get really dim illumination to as much as 2,000 feet on a really clear day, midday. But get this, and it's taken me a long time for this to come into focus, but it's perfectly obvious if you think about it. Most of life on Earth is in the ocean. Okay, 97% of the biosphere where life exists is out there in the ocean. The Gulf of Mexico connected to all of the rest of the global ocean. All of it is dark all of the time and the rest has some illumination. It's dark at least half of the time, day, night. You know, we love our light, but we too love the dark. But imagine not having a choice. You live in the dark all the time. Most of life on Earth lives in the ocean below a thousand feet. And we're just beginning to appreciate the importance of exploring that part of the planet that keeps us alive. It's the carbon cycle, it's the oxygen cycle, it's the water cycle, all that stuff. That if you're lucky now, early in the 21st century, because a lot of this we're beginning to 
put into place for the first time. I mean, as a kid, I learned letters, I learned numbers, but I didn't learn about photosynthesis until way later. <laughs> Where does air come from? I didn't even ask. I took it for granted. Air just, it was. Water just came out of the sky. But now we have David Attenborough <laughs> telling us with <laughs> how the world works. We've got the National Geographic. We've got, huh, well, when I was a kid, <clears throat> yeah, when I was a kid, many years ago, we did not have television. We did not have the benefit of the internet or all of those means that now inform you of the way the world works, the way people live all over the world, to show what's happening to the planet owing to our prosperity. That when I arrived, there were two billion people. By 1980, there were four billion people. Now we're closing in on doubling that number. Certainly by the middle of this century, we will be at that level of having quadrupled the number of people who were here when I arrived. But I have to thank this place, the Dunedin Public Library, because there were books through most of human civilization going back 10,000 years ago, books did not exist. For me, it was huh, the way to know the world. And of course, Nas National Geographic that we subscribed to as a family up in New mm -hmm. Jersey. And we didn't move everything south when we came to Florida, but we moved the National Geographics. <laughs> the house has always been kind of tilted in one direction because <laughs> <laughs> you keep the National Geographics over there. But books. I used to sit on the floor of the Dunedin Public Library when it was down on the waterfront next to Saunders Fish House, next to that little fountain. There's a place that had a sign on it that said, Dunedin, best drinking water in Florida. Water came out of the ground from the aquifer right down under this where we're sitting now. People would come from all over to tap into Dunedin's water in the 1940s and the 1950s. Well, that's long gone, and the library has moved, and it's become bigger with many more books, but it was sitting on the floor of the Dunedin Library that I read William Beebe in his book about building a little submarine and going deep in the ocean. The book was called half mile down. And it transformed my expectations of what might be possible. Now, I was told as a little girl that the things that I could do as a girl, I could be, I could be a teacher, and I love teaching and I love teachers, but I was never told I could be a superintendent. I could be a secretary, but I couldn't be a CEO. That was not even imaginable. Uh, I could be I could do something really, ex well, I could be a nurse, but not a doctor. That was too far a reach. But to do something exciting, I could be an airline stewardess, <laughs> not a pilot. <laughs> but there were no, in reading about a submarine, there's nothing that said I couldn't drive a submarine or that I could do what BB did with engineers, a fellow engineer, Otis Barton, they cooked up the idea of building a submarine and going down half a mile, the first humans to go as much as half a mile beneath the surface and come back. I mean, lots of people are way deeper than half a mile and they're still there. But the idea of using technology such as we have used to go high in the sky to be able to wrap yourself in a system that, where you don't feel the pressure inside, it's the same pressure as you have here in this room, uh, and go deep in the ocean. So in 1979, I had a chance to do that, the system called the gym, named after the first person willing to put it on, and to explore the ocean. And that really inspired me to do what Bibi and Barton had done years before, to work with engineers to build this submarine, so simple to drive that even a scientist can do it. <laughs> I'm a living proof. <laughs> 
But lots of scientists got to use this little submarine and others too. And their variations have been developed over the last, well, few decades, three person subs. This is another variation of the little system called Deep Rover. It's out there in the Gulf of Mexico, the BBC used it for their Blue Planet series, a little submarine that I have fingerprints on, built back in the 1980s. And this derivative of that submarine called the Deep Worker. For five years, National Geographic, with support from a foundation out in California and the institution where I later became the chief scientist, NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, we cooked up a great scheme to get kids, teachers, other scientists, CEOs, anybody we could catch to go out and explore the ocean from the inside out by getting into a little submarine. Again, so simple to drive that anybody can do it. And that was the idea. Five years of going around the Gulf of Mexico, stopping here in Tampa Bay, going to the Florida Aquarium. That was from 1998 to 2003. Some of you may have been around during that time when we came aboard NOAA ships and invited the public to come in and share the view of what's out there, down there in the Gulf of Mexico. You know, I dream of having Hertz rent a sub. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's possible, why not? You, got, you can go hire an airplane and take off for the afternoon if you wish. Why not have enough submarines out there so that if any of you want to go out to 1,000 feet, 2,000 feet, or maybe down 10,000 feet someday, it's going to be possible. And with my daughter and my son-in-law over there, who are checking this out to make sure I'm getting it right, <laughs> Ian Griffith and Liz Taylor, building new generations of submarines that will democratize access to the sea. And one of these days, I hope that right here in Dunedin, we can launch not only a hope spot, but deep hope subs to be able to go out, not just knee deep, not just neck deep, not just diver depth, but let's go keep going, going and going. Here's the thing, on the west coast of Florida, you have to go way out to get deeper than you can go as a diver. There's another Florida out there. Those continental shelf slopes very gradually off where we are right now. I was stunned as a kid listening to Archie Carr talk about the other Florida, the one that's submerged off the west coast. I was so thrilled later as a young scientist to explore the seagrass meadows that extend way offshore from the Wakasasa River, from the Steinhatchee River, from the Withlacoochee River, from all those rivers right up the Apalachicola River. There's a great meadow of seagrasses offshore, a nursery area for little fish and big fish and shrimp and the whole zoo of creatures that populate the Gulf of Mexico often get their start right here in Tampa Bay, right offshore from where we're sitting now and on up the coast, this amazing sunlit portion of that other Florida. And I've also witnessed the changes that have taken place. In ignorance, we have been putting so much stuff into the Gulf as well as taking a great deal out. But if we can go out there, if you can go out there in a little submarine and see it and witness it for yourself, It'll arm us with knowledge to know what to do to restore health. <laughs> Imagine a fleet of little subs or little remotely operated vehicles. Those are the, you know, the greatest thing in, in the ocean these days. There are hundreds of these remotely operated vehicles of various sorts. You sit on the surface and you operate a little robot, like a drone, but not sometimes with a cable, sometimes not to get to explore the ocean. This is one of the concoctions that Liz and Ian have developed with a company they have called Deep Ocean Exploration and Research to go down through a hole in the ice in Antarctica 
like a transformer toy to open up through a little hole in the ice, go down and explore what's below. Here's the thing. We, for the first time in all of the history of humankind, have the power of choice. What is the world we want? I mean, I didn't think about that much as a kid. I thought the world would always be the world, way the world, I thought, was at the time. That I did not appreciate how much we humans are the agents of change. How we've consumed the wild things. How we have put into the air, into the water, onto the land. I mean, Rachel Carson kind of woke us up in the 1960s with Silent World about what we thought was a good thing using chemicals that improved the rate of growth of crops because we got rid of all those dreaded insects. Huh. But if you read the headlines today, and I hope you do, about the concern about the loss of insects, that we need to take care of those, <laughs> what we used to think of as damn bugs. We need to love a bug. We need to think about how we can understand the, what keeps us alive. We need the insects, like those little planktonic organisms in the ocean. They are translators of the sun's energy through the food chain. And if you are not up to speed on the carbon cycle, the oxygen cycle, the water cycle, hey, anybody can do it. A kid can do it. If you're 90 years old, you can do it. I mean, huh, it's there to be done. The knowledge that did not exist when I was a kid could not exist when I was a kid now is there for all of you to tap into. And this place, this library, is like the center of the universe or where you can get a jump start on what nobody knew when many of us arrived on the planet. So we have evidence now that the planet is warming and that the place that I thought was permanently there, the Arctic, I thought Santa Claus would always be safe <laughs> and that polar bears would never have to worry about ice. But we're now seeing changes brought about because of us. Coral reefs around the world love having warm water, but if it gets too warm for too long, they die. They go from this amazing, lush kind of growth to this, and then ultimately just die. So changes are natural. I mean, there used to be another whole Florida that was above water. Ice ages come, ice ages go, but what's happening on our watch is our ability to push the fast forward button at a level that is unprecedented, bringing about changes that the natural world is not able to accommodate, to adapt to. And why does that matter? Because if, <laughs> if you like to breathe, you'll, you'll worry about where oxygen comes from, trees. In North America, literally only 5% of the old growth forest, forests still survive. A few old growth trees like those that remain here in Dunedin, well, we should treasure them, but we should treasure the systems even more. And in the ocean, similarly, phytoplankton since 1950 has declined by 40%. We can still breathe, that's the good news. But just take that trajectory forward. You lose the trees, you lose the natural vegetation, you lose the vegetation in the ocean where our oxygen comes from. Shouldn't we kind of plan ahead and think about, ah, oh, be nice to the trees, be nice to the phytoplankton, be nice to the corals. We haven't been very nice to them in ignorance. We put things into the ocean thinking it doesn't matter. All of the derelict fishing nets that once upon a time, every fishing line, every fishing net counted, but in today's world using plastics, it's easy to discard things into the ocean because they're cheap relative to what nets and lines were not so long ago. And I come from the pre-plasticozoic. <laughs> My first acquaintance with plastic, as I remember it, was Tupperware. Does anybody in this room have Tupperware? 
I still have my mom's Tupperware. <laughs> you don't throw it away because it's meant to last. It's a great thing about plastic. It lasts, all these synthetic materials, they are durable, but they're too durable. And when you only use a thing once and throw it away, then you get problems. And now this is not an uncommon scene in places around the world. We've become addicted to use it once, throw it away. And one of the biggest problems there is that those big plastics break up into little plastics until they get to be microplastics. And even in the course of breathing, sometimes you are taking in these little tiny, tiny fragments. Or drinking water, it's in everything. It's in beer. It's certainly in the ocean. And plankton, little fish, big fish, whales are consuming that plankton. Now, I have a choice about swimming in an ocean that is loaded with plastic like this, but the fish don't have a choice. That's their home. And we have put so much of our junk into the ocean that it's going to be a legacy for a long time. And I know some of you in this room are concerned about that and are trying to do what you can to retrieve what we've already put in there and doing whatever we can to keep it from getting there in the first place. So, I really value having been around during this extraordinary piece of history when we've learned so much about who we are, where we've come from. Our prosperity has given us the view of Earth from space. People have been to the deepest part of the ocean starting in 1960. And then again in 2012 when James Cameron actually went all by himself. James Cameron, the filmmaker who made Avatar and Titanic and Terminator, among other great Hollywood productions, but he's also an explorer, a fellow explorer in residence at the National Geographic. To see that there's life in the deepest sea, life seven miles up in the sky, spiders with little webs like the plankton in the sky, insects, birds flying, not at seven miles, but pretty high in the sky. But knowing these things that we could not know until fairly recently, I, I had a conversation with this bird. Turns out this is an albatross that began flying about the same time that I began learning to dive. So we've seen the changes in the world during the same piece of history in the last 50 years or so. Well, she was banded in the 1950s, again, when I began um, learning how to dive. Think of the changes since that time. In her world, squid are less common than they used to be. Noise in the ocean. Where did that come from? All the ships that have come about with motorized traffic. We now ship goods. 90% of all the things we wear or eat, or all the appliances, the, good, the steel, whatever it is, come from one part of the world to another by ship. And it's creating a, a whole atmosphere of noise that didn't exist during the days of sail or when ships were fewer, when our numbers were smaller. She didn't know about aircraft in the sky until she got to begin to fly across the ocean. And now, during her lifetime, plastics have come along. During my lifetime, plastics have come along. But for me, I mean, they've been a convenience for her. They look like food, and she stuffs her little chick, about one chick every year or so, that she and her mate for life um, try to raise, but often they die because they're stuffed with plastic. Thing is, I know why these changes have taken place. She does not know. She can't know. I mean, she's smart. She can do things I don't know how to do. She can fly, travel, thousands of miles and come back to the exact same place without GPS. I mean, it's a built-in GPS. <laughs> I wish I had that. <laughs> I get lost coming to the library <laughs> this morning. <laughs> but we have the power of knowing. 
And we also have the power of caring. But first you have to know, and then you might care. You might care about the fate of these birds that live as long as humans. You might care about the power that we have now. I met this kid who got to be president, George W. Bush, on an occasion when he was using his power as a fisherman to sign into law the largest marine protected area on the planet around the northwestern Hawaiian Islands where those albatrosses nest. It's the Papahanaumokuakea Marine Reserve, the Marine National Monument. It was actually Laura Bush who had a lot to do with convincing George that this would be a good idea because she went out to Midway Island. She saw all the plastic. She met that bird whose name is Wisdom. And I had a chance to reinforce what I'm sure she had already convinced him about at an opportunity over a dinner at the White House where by a chance I got to sit at a table with six people with George W. Bush and we talked about about if there, ha if there are to be fish, you've got to, if there are to be fishermen, Mr. Fisherman President, you have to have fish. <laughs> and to have fish, you have to do what we've done for birds on the land. If you want to have ducks and geese, songbirds, you have to protect the places they live. You can do it in your backyard. You can do it with national parks. You can do it with marshes that you proactively protect. But if you just take them anywhere, anytime, in any numbers, there won't be any birds, there won't be any fish anymore. And whatever, I mean, he had a lot on his mind. Um, I mean, wars and the economy and all those things, healthcare. <laughs> but he didn't know that 90% of the big fish are already gone. He did not know that the number of places in the ocean that were protected at that time were a fraction of 1% or even the fish were safe. And so along with the motivation that was already there, he took these things into account and signed into law this, what turned out to be the largest marine protected area on the planet. Now, owing to the momentum that that began and that President Obama continued by quadrupling the size of the area that Bush designated, in the Hawaiian Islands and with other places, and that other presidents and other people around the world, we now have about 3% of the ocean where even the fish are safe. About 7% has some form of protection. And it doesn't count places that are designated now as hope spots that are not yet officially protected, but where people have taken personal action use their personal powers to take care of a little piece of marsh or, or to work in the community to say, let's just keep this place safe for the fish. It's happening in places all over the world. And where full protection takes place, it's amazing to see the recovery just as on the land. If you start protection, you plant trees, the birds come. It's about the habitat. It's about giving back. The biggest area so far on the planet is in Antarctica, where nations got together and decided that the Ross Sea should be a protected area. Well, that was in 2016. Other moves are in the works. There's a move to have 10% of the ocean by 2020, 30% of the ocean by 2030. Another move to say, why don't we take half of the whole world, land and sea, and make sure that the trees, the birds, the insects, the fish, the whales, that all of it, have safe havens. And that means that maybe we'll have a safe haven on the planet as well. It's still pretty greedy to think, we want half for ourselves. <laughs> but right now we've got 97% of the ocean and it's not working, even with the deliberate efforts to try to care. So the good news is knowing, the good news is we have power, everybody does. In fact, I tell kids, all right, kids, whoever you are in the audience, you have superpowers that I didn't have when I was a kid because you know things I couldn't know. I mean, I've never seen Earth from space. You have. 
And you know that there's stuff out there in the ocean that we've only discovered in the last few years. If you haven't seen Blue Planet 2, the BBC's production, do what I did, binge watch it from the beginning <laughs> to end, and get up to speed about what's out there, down there, and then use your mighty superpowers and figure out how am I going to get out there? How am I going to do How can I build a submarine? I mean, why not? Why not? So, Hope Spots, the concept of getting people like you to use your vision. You want to improve the state of the Gulf of Mexico, of St. Joseph Sound, Clearwater Beach, the marshes here, more mangroves rather than fewer mangroves. You've got the power to do that. You can do it one tree at a time, one kid at a time. And I'm so pleased, Ray, that you gave the introduction while I was finding my way to the library. <laughs> it isn't where it used to be. <laughs> All over the world now, people are taking action using their power of choice. Thinking, you know, the Rio Plus 20 conference down in 2012, the headline was, what's, what is the planet we want? What's the future you want? Because we can choose. We can keep doing what we've been doing and we'll wind up in a kind of a bad place. Or we can change and make better choices about how we deal with nature. And we can really have a planet that is able to accommodate who we are, at least at the present level. I suppose there are limits to how many people there ultimately can be, but we can do better than what we're doing right now. You can do better, each of you, with choices you make. There are 112 hope spots around the world that have been put together by people just like you who say, we're going to work, we're going to submit an application to Mission Blue, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature with their mighty little gathering of experts will review our application and guide us and help to figure out in this area or that area what can be done to connect with others to solve problems, to do an inventory of, well, who lives here anyway? It, find out. I mean, Moat Marine Laboratory has great information. The University of South Florida, St. Petersburg College, they, all these People have been, you know, counting the fish, counting the birds, looking at the, the areas offshore where springs bubble up in the Gulf of Mexico. Wouldn't it be nice to just gather that all together and share the view with the powers that we now have of communicating and make this one big, beautiful hope spot? And perhaps that can lead to some areas within the Gulf Coast where even the fish and the crabs and the little seahorses and seagrass meadows and all of it can have a safe haven. And that means that life for humans will be better as well. Well, here are two of my hope spots. I have four grandsons, and that's what motivates me more than anything, I suppose. Of course, I want a better place to live and air to breathe and water to drink and more wildlife on my watch. But if I do what I can, now, things are going to get better. I've watched this happen. But I've also watched cause for hope. The people are beginning to see what is possible and to do what's possible, what every one of us, no one can do everything, but everybody can do something. Times seven billion, we can really get to where we need to go. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Thank you. cautioned us, well, he said uh, he wanted uh, a one-armed economist because he said he was so tired of hearing on the one hand, on the other hand. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes I feel that way about environmentalists and when somebody was asking about um, the deep rising and the dispersal was going the wrong direction or making a national park out of you know, Chesapeake is mm -hmm. going the wrong direction. Are there things that are obviously going the wrong direction that the environmentalists are 
touting. A few years ago, they were um, saying if we dredged Clearwater Pass, it would wreck the bay, and if we didn't dredge Clearwater Pass, <laughs> and, and they each had their scientists, so how yeah. do we evaluate? If you dredge the pass, it's good news. You dredge the pass, it's bad news. I, I try to think like a fish and imagine that you're out there. What, what would you, which way would you go? <laughs> and every situation is somewhat different. Passes get formed by hurricanes as well as by people. But we somehow think we can engineer the world to our liking. And so often we find that we've moved in exactly the wrong direction. About a third of Tampa Bay is now filled. About a third of San Francisco Bay is filled. So the natural, what, circulation is compromised. And what we're putting into both areas, or Chesapeake Bay, has changed the chemistry of the place. I mean, I've, it's pretty obvious when you really think about it. If you want to look at the world and alter its nature in a way that would not be good for us, change the temperature, change the chemistry, and destroy the wild. And they all tie together because the wild shapes the chemistry and it does influence the temperature. I mean, stand in the sun versus standing under a tree. Um, it's Anyway, so we've done all these things. We've changed the temperature, we're changing the chemistry, we're destroying the wildlife. Maybe you've seen headlines this week that came out about a, a big international report about it. We're losing a million species on a fast track. We're down to the critical point where they'll either be with us or not, depending on what we do or don't do, probably in the next 10 years. And that includes bluefin tuna. If we continue to hammer away at them the way we are, with 3% remaining in the Pacific, based on the fishermen's own records. What chance has a big fish got when one fish will sell in the Tokyo fish market for, what was the fig latest figure, $3.1 million for one fish? It's not feeding starving people. It's feeding a luxury taste, which most tuna does anyway, not because you need to eat tuna, because you choose to eat tuna. A long way to get around to your question about the pass. Try to get knowledgeable about what the pros and cons are. And, I mean, really get to the bottom of it. Look at the evidence yourself and think like a fish. <laughs> and look at the past and anticipate the future. And try to be as honest as you can about the decision making. Look at who's recommending this. Who is recommending that? And often you get, you get the answer about why this person is recommending whatever it is they're doing. It's because they have a vested interest behind it. What advice do you have for kids? Ah, what advice do you have for kids? Well, I think everybody here is a kid, <laughs> one way or the other. <laughs> if you think otherwise, look again, because <laughs> there's a kid inside of every one of us. Um, People ask me, how did you get to be a scientist? How did you get to be explorer in residence at the National Geographic? And I say, it's really pretty easy. You start out as a kid and you do what kids do. You ask questions. Always, I mean, when you're, what is this? You know, who, what, how, why? And don't ever stop. Don't ever stop asking questions. And when somebody tells you something and you will say, I wonder if that's true, you keep asking questions. You say, really? How do you know that? How do you know that the, the decision back there, that it's better to cut through the, the pass or not? Um, how do you know that? You know, keep digging, keep asking those questions. And most scientists, well, I think all the good ones, <laughs> never stop asking questions. And to realize, although it seems like I'm just a kid, I, what can I do? You have kid power that I, I did not have because I didn't know what you learn now. I mean, as I say, I never, 
imagine what Earth looked like from space. We had these globes of the ocean, of the, of the world, that you could spin around. You could see a lot of the world was blue, but those, you had some idea of where the cities were and where the mountains were, but the ocean was just big blobs of blue. But now we know there are mountains in the ocean. And we now have submarines that you can go down and explore. You can look over the shoulders of David Attenborough and not just Jacques Cousteau, who could only go you know, so deep, but now look over the shoulders of James Cameron, who went to the deepest part of the ocean. And I find something that is really, that, that, that's you. you know, what do you like to do most? Some people have a way with music. Some, some people are good with numbers. I, I was told when I was a kid that I had a way with words. And, and I love to write, and I still write. And I brought some books to leave here at the library, actually. And I'm working on another one right now. And it, it seemed when I was a kid that my job was to learn everything in this library here in Dunedin. And then I started asking questions and I couldn't find the answers in the library. And I realized that we don't have all the answers yet. I found a little crab out there in the Gulf. And I wanted to know what kind of crab it was. What's your name? And does anybody know who you are, where you come from, what do you do? There weren't answers here. So I had to observe carefully and report honestly what I saw as a kid. I knew more about that crab than <laughs> than I could find out in the library. And, and that's what you can do too. Go look and observe and then tell others what you see. And don't be satisfied with, with answers that don't make sense to you. Keep asking why. And maybe even, well, why not? Because <laughs> that's what it takes to get from where humanity was a thousand years ago to where we got to 500 years ago, to where we are now. And we have a long way to go to get to an even better place. And every kid has a chance to really get out there and make a real difference. I get the privilege of working with animals and educating children about the natural ecosystems around Florida. Mm -hmm. And I get to see that excitement. And mm -hmm. then I also uh, try to live a conservation-friendly lifestyle and vote in that direction right. but it seems like in my lifetime I can only look at what I've gathered but uh, in that time the urgency and the movement just seems it seems so slow and I was wondering with your vision with the hope spots if mm -hmm. there's more that people just regular people like <laughs> me can be doing to uh, what you would have us do basically for yeah well I think the hope spot concept is like a magnet to draw the best that people have to give and to become involved in whatever your special thing is. If you take pictures, oh, we love to get photographs of, that you can share. And this provides a baseline. Or here's how it is in 2019. If you keep those as a record, How's it going to be in another year or 10 or on into the future? You need a starting place. And sometimes you can go back and get earlier pictures to see how it's changed from where, when it was to now. And, and share that information. It's all about knowing and knowing what the problem is. And then look at yourself and say, well, I can do this. No one can do everything, but we all have something that we can do. Uh, one of my grandsons is drawn to photography and art great. Um, my younger daughter has a, a great voice and she uh, composes and sings. Liz runs a submarine company, for heaven's sakes, and married an engineer. And <laughs> so they're doing their thing. Everybody is different. Glory be. Everybody can do that thing that makes you different. And pull together, but knowing what the problem is, knowing where, here's where we are, we want that better place. And let's go get there. So tomorrow's Mother's Day, and I'm gonna thank yes. you. And I'm gonna thank you, Mother. <laughs> <laughs> you have your own family, and you sacrificed, but you sacrificed for all of us. And I wanna let you know that we hear you. 
my husband. Mm, sorry. <laughs> it's just so close to my heart. We don't eat meat. I was never going to give up my scrimps. I love scrimps. I haven't had one in three years. <laughs> the shrimp, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and the salmon and everything yeah. else. It was all the seafood that we gave up. Right. Um, I watched some things on YouTube of your speeches at TED Talks last night, and I thought, thank God I'm not part of that problem. Thank God that net doesn't have anything in there for me. And I feel good about that. And I have a hydroponic garden, and we keep bees in the backyard. Yes. And I want you to know that you come out here and you talk, and you may think that all we're doing is asking for all the worst. Because I had a couple of questions to ask about how bad is it really in places. But really what I want you to know is that we hear you. Thank you. So thank you for your time. What's next? Um, we have a lot of spots, and thank you for your inspiration for all the work you have done. But also, um, we've noticed that there's a big result. We see sharks, we see sea lions, everything coming back up, and it's working. It's really great. But what's next? What we're seeing now is that all our, not all of them, but a lot of the tunas that migrate out of the spots get caught in international waters. And I noticed on your, on your picture right there in Antarctica, which belongs to everybody, you know, and really cares that you actually have created those safe areas, which yes. is unbelievable. So where do we go? Because the corridor, that's a problem. From Galapagos mm -hmm. to Cocos Island, we are losing, um, you know, everyone is over 200 ships right out there, mm -hmm. just to clear the oceans. And what do we do now? What's the next step to protect not just the spot which are working, right. but the corridors? <laughs> So within areas of national jurisdiction, we call that the exclusive economic zones. So an idea that came into focus in the 1980s, about the same time that we stopped commercially extracting whales from the ocean, about the same time that a little microbe in the ocean called Prochlorococcus was discovered that puts about 20% of the oxygen in the atmosphere that we didn't know of its existence until then, mid-1980s. Nations around the world extended their jurisdiction out 200 miles. And it's within that area that action is now being taken for these marine reserves that are largely coming into play, where most of that 3%, but as you point out in Antarctica, that's part of the global commons. It's not part of any nation's jurisdiction. It's a part that all of us have a vested interest in. We have a claim to the waters around Antarctica and for the high seas. So in answer to your question, I am, and I'm not alone, there's a big move ahead um, that is trying to encourage protection for the high seas, all of the ocean beyond national jurisdiction. <laughs> We're, we're industrial fishing. We're not talking families, we're not talking communities, we're not talking the coastal benefits that people have from taking wildlife from the sea. We are talking about a place where until the latter part of the 20th century, people did not go. They didn't go into the high seas. It's too far uh, and it's dangerous. We didn't have GPS to guide us to where we need to be on the high seas until fairly recent times. And you look at those courageous explorers of the 15 and 16 and 17 and 1800s or the whalers who set out as they killed the whales close to shore, they had to go further and further offshore until they went to the Galapagos Islands from Massachusetts to find whales to kill. And, but, but all things generally speaking, the high seas have been safe for the fish until the last few decades. Now, the tuna fishing on the high seas, out in the part of the ocean that you own, everybody owns, everybody, if anybody does, maybe we don't own it, but at least we, we have a vested interest in what happens there. Nobody, no human really can claim the high seas. So why not leave it alone? Why not take the blue heart of the heart 
of the ocean and say, that's our bank account, that's our safe haven, that's our life support system, that's what generates oxygen, that's where most of the water goes up into the sky, that's where carbon is captured, that's where fish, if we leave them alone, can do their thing and repopulate the, the, the coastal areas, like the tuna. If you don't kill them out there in the high seas, there'll be more fish times at least seven, according to the best scientific analysis. Just leave them alone. And okay, so who suffers if we don't do that? If we, if we don't take on an industrial scale from the high seas? There are about 12 countries, five in particular, mostly Asian countries, mostly Indonesia, China, Japan, Taiwan, but also Spain, that top the list for taking from the high seas. So that's not everybody everywhere. And there are a few corporations, a few families that are behind the funding of the fleets that are out there in the high seas. And so it's, people generally would not suffer, people generally would benefit if we just eliminate industrial fishing from the high seas. It doesn't mean that we can just have a free for all everywhere else. We have to be careful about what we take. Having these protected areas in coastal regions, especially the breeding areas, the feeding areas, and the corridors, as you point out. We need to be mindful, as we were with wild birds. We have to think about what it takes to make wild fish as well, and, and to be serious about it. But right now, it's the, like the Wild West out on the high seas. So how do, what do we do about it? Well, first acknowledge that we've got this problem and then figure out, like everything else, what do you have that you can give to help make the difference? Work with the legislatures in the state, in the nation. The United Nations is not perfect by any means, but they do have a, a, the power of convening people around the world and influencing policy that, that could make a difference. But first you have to know, people <laughs> are complacent, they don't know what it takes to make a tuna fish. They don't know that their populations are seriously threatened. They don't know how magnificent these creatures are in life. All they know is, mmm, delicious. <laughs> and that we need to change that perception. Do you ever lose hope? <laughs> Do I lose hope? Um, I cannot afford that luxury. That's what you said? <laughs> it would be so easy to say, I'm just going to go sit under a palm tree. <laughs> I'm going to sit by Lake Earl and watch the turtles and see the birds and let, other, let the world go by. I cannot do that. I cannot. It's a cannot. I'm literally driven to try to share the view, if you will, and get others to sense the urgency that we have a chance to turn things around. But if we dilly-dally, and if we think it's hopeless, then it's hopeless. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. But if you give up, that's it. So don't ever give up. I mean, you can always make things better.